I have African Farmer Mortgage in the studio. Thank you so much for your time. It's good to have you uh, around. Thank you for having me again. Yes. Uh, truth be told, it's a time that we all need to be worried. Mm -hmm. Just like we're worried about the debt issue, we should be worried about food. I don't think food is more scary <laughs> than the <laughs> debt angle of it. But, but, but let's do an overview first because you're in the system and I always like us to have a background to what we want to talk about. After COVID, moving on, uh, we thought all was well. Well, slightly COVID is still hitting in some areas, in some countries. We still have lockdowns, we have restrictions. All of this is affecting movement of um, food produce and all of that, particularly grains, wheat, and all of that. Mm, what's happening? T tell us your experience. Well, um, it's predicted, uh, especially during COVID, that food prices, <coughs> excuse me, food prices will go high. Um, however, uh, it's also predicted that if we don't take action, if we're not proactive, we will be where we are today. And unfortunately, the Russia-Ukraine oh. challenges, you know, came on board. And um, I, I remember, I recall, I was here end of February and sometime in March, you know, talking about that the fact that this is not going to be a usual war. It's yes. going to be a food war. I did say it here and on your breakfast program. And now it has evolved to being a food war because people were not aware of what had happened in November, October 2021. You know, so bottom line is that countries like Egypt took proactive actions over imported from India. So they have stock. huge stock. Well, we were just observing as an international... We're taking our time. Yeah, we were, we were thinking <laughs> it's an international issue you know so why we are here is because we've not been proactive mm -hmm. and um i don't blame government for it also i blame more private sector because private sector have the funds also they could have also you know brought in experts to say where is this going to take advantage of that you know so just imagine if one of the billionaires in nigeria has brought in excess wheat and coal now they will be smiling more to the bank. So it's not only government. It's both government and private sector that have not been proactive. Mm. Talking about how inflation bites hard. Now, let's be very practical here. Bread, the bread you buy maybe for 100 naira before now, you buy at 200 naira. Mm -hmm. And it's not even as, uh, you know, when, when you look at the loaves, <laughs> it's not what it used to be. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that is one. Also other food uh, food products, you know, when you want to buy uh, pepper, tomatoes, and all of that, you must agree with me that the monies you drop at home or that you give at home for food must have increased one way or the other. The purchasing power uh, doesn't match up with that. Insecurity is something that many of our farmers have identified that they cannot go to their farms. Yeah. One way or the other, they cannot harvest even when they're supposed to go uh, to the farm. What's the true picture of this? Well, um, it's more... We're feeling more impact of farmers not being able to go to their farms in various sectors uh, or regions of the country more than others. Now, so not east, not west, a bit of north central, but southwest is not really affected like the northern part of the country. But southwest also is not proactive. You know, so now we have people being challenged. People who are not really challenged, who have not taken advantage. But bottom line is that in some areas, we can say farmers cannot go to the farm. In the southwest uh, and some um, not central, they can go to the farm. Mm -hmm. But productivity is a challenge. You know, see, I have said this uh, because I've been around many of the government intervention and even developmental, I mean, uh, foreign donors. All those programs have said, is meant to keep the farmers poor. And why do I say this? You, they still give, and I've said it many times, they give the farmers the seed that have low yield. They give them same fertilizer, give them same input, and want them to work miracles out of it. Meanwhile, in the same country, we have seeds that would give double the output. So it's the same labor, it's the same... Uh, land preparation, same everything. So if you have a seed that will give you five to six tons and you provide the farmers with government intervention uh, that will give them two tons, 2.5 tons, 
of what use is that in incentive? So if we have been proactive in embracing best practices and supporting the farmers with good input, productivity now, even though the farmer land size has reduced, we will still be able to get something out. And also, you know, um, Nigerians, we are trapped in our pasts. You know, we just talk about past, past, past. In the country currently, there are agri inputs that is currently in the country that can help the farmers at least double their productivity, double their yields. But, you know, everybody's talking about the old, nobody's focusing about the new. And one more thing, we focus on the infrastructure that we don't have. Mm. We forget the underutilized or abandoned infrastructure, begging for people to just wake up. If we leverage the abandoned infrastructure, we will feed ourselves. I think right now we should, you know, step it down from talking about what we don't have and we cannot get because we don't have the money and focus on what we have, the dams. The roads are bad, yes, but the roads are motorable. But it, and the truth also is the roads are better now than before. That's the truth. Uh, I'm not a politician, but the roads are better now than before across the country. Mm. I saw the Minister of Works and Housing talking about that, uh, not limited to just one state, it's all across the country. Yes, yes I think I, I, I've been more. It's not a popular too. conversation, yeah, of course, but we will of say course. it. We, we say are it. in the field. Yes, true. We the roads are better, Good. you know, so it's better, so we should stop the narrative around roads. Can we use the better roads? How are we moving the foods? You know, we need more logistics now, not the roads. It's old syllabus talking about bad roads. It can be improved. Do you get, but there are better roads. Mm. Now, let's move on now to support. Mm. We've been getting a lot of support. And when things like this happen, it's always a norm. Monies come from everywhere. The FDB is in, IFAD is in, <laughs> the government is in, and everybody comes in with support. And we keep hearing millions of dollars and all of that being coming, uh, coming in. I also know that the central bank has also invested in, uh, I think, farmers to you know, double of the acres of water they used to do with regards to also wheat to bridge the same gap. Is it not too late? One, it is late and it is wrong. The first, I, I used to grow wheat in Jigawa. You know, a lot of these things, they bamboozle us on. Do we have a comparative advantage in growing wheat? The answer is no. no. We have a comparative advantage in growing cassava, in growing yams, in growing corn. Wheat does not affect everybody. Bread is luxury. That's the truth. Bread is luxury. Yam is not luxury. Tomato is not luxury. We need corn. If CBN focuses, or AFDB, focuses heavily on corn, the cereals that the children eat, the livestock, all those prices will come down. There will be high protein intake. What I'm saying is that the international politics around food security is huge. Let's forget, there's a lot of politics around food. And why do we have, you know, um, developmental agencies fund projects that you don't have comparative advantage on? And let me share an example. I won't just mention names. You know, so we've had, we have institutes in the country that are about 20, 30 years old that are working on like corn and some other grains. They will tell you they are working on the nutrition, not the yield. So you still have the same yield that we've had in 20 years, but they say they want it to be more nutritious. But until it is profitable for the farmer, the farmer cannot scale it, which is politics. So they will hear the billions of dollars coming in, but they, they, you get at, you know, they, they track it down to wrong things. They, they will fund you. I've been involved in all this. There's nothing, you know, they will, fund, they will give you 1 million euros. They will tell you 250,000 euros should be for travel. Uh, another 150,000 euro for consultancy. The money to spend on the project is very small. That is the truth about all this big funding we hear. It is not genuine. And when you hear about CBN funding also, you know, monitoring and evaluation kills all um, CBN interventions. You hear about the big output. If we are, they say, oh, uh, yield has increased, but the food in the market, market has increased, you know, 100%, 50%. So we need to stop deceiving ourselves and, you know, open new conversations around how are they doing it in India that they are getting results in Malaysia and it's no rocket science. Monitoring and evaluation and bringing new innovations. The innovation is in the country. 
It's just that, do you have the right people there? I, do we have the right people in the ministries of agriculture um, who are heading agriculture, water resources, ministry for youth and development? Do we have the right people there with the right experience? Not a PhD holder, with all due respect to PhD holders. We need practical people. Enough of this consultant. I, I'm checking around um, the politicians because politics influences agriculture. And I'm, and I'm not seeing the right conversations. I'm seeing consultants speak through them. But the consultants write document. How many, the big consulting companies, how many of them have you know, written consulting uh, uh, feasibilities that has worked? They all fail because there's a factor, ground, the, 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 the local technology. President Ambassador Joe calls it local intelligence. You know, that is missing from those things that three years down the line, it crashes. So we need players in those ministries for us to be food secure. If not, huge challenge coming. You talked about seed, uh, and I know that um, one way or the other I've come across this uh, genetically modified uh, seeds and all of that, that I think could, could tell us uh, more <laughs> about that. And is that the way to go? <laughs> so, so you see, the GMO conversation, a lot of ignorance is out there about, course, about GMOs. Of course. Now, many people don't know that a, a majority of their ketchup, a majority of their cereals, is produced from genetically modified crops, especially the middle upper class that seem to want their crazy for foreign foods. Almost everything, you know, their brands of oil that they take is all GMOs. Now, I'm neither for GMO nor, nor against, against GMO. GMO. I stand in the middle. If we can not feed ourselves, and it is GMOs that we need, we need to first feed, stay alive to now see if one food is good or the other. But GMOs have evolved over 20, 30 years. And you, you, we don't have any crop in its natural state. And that is truth, a majority, cocoa, cola, name it. So we need to balance it. We need our reserves, our foreign, our, sorry, as a foreign reserve, <laughs> our, our food reserves food that reserve. are empty, we need them filled. If it is G and what's the benefit of the GMOs? One, it is immune to climate change. Uh, so pest invasion, weed invasion, you know, it, it secures that the farmer makes profit and food is available. Right now, the prices are going higher. If we have that now, I'm sure everybody will say government is doing fine. However, if there's a mutation, if something happens along the line, we don't have the research institutes adequately equipped to be able to track what happened. So, that's, so I am saying that for the GMOs, we can have a few big companies invest in it, produce in it, store it, government will compensate you if we don't consume it. But paraventure, what we've observed in Europe is happening now where the heat wave, the dams in the Netherlands dried up and cool. If we have it in Nigeria, we won't be talking about GMO or no GMO. Put the food on the table. So we, however, for me in Nigeria, because of that infrastructure that we don't have, we need to pay attention to still use the conventional, the hybrids. I am more for the hybrids. We need to advance to GMOs. We've not gotten there, but if we have to use it, we have to use it. GMO is not as bad as it used to be. It's been worked on, and it's food. And I've eaten it, you know. But and many of us are regularly, the rice we eat generally is GMO. Let, let, let's, let's, <laughs> let's wrap up on, on this note. I, I was reading through, and I saw that our budget from 2016 to 2021 is about 874.83 billion naira. Meanwhile, imports of agricultural products into the country within the same period is 7.81 trillion naira. Where do we stand in all of this? It shows that we still keep importing. Yes, we're still importing. But the good thing, actually, I, I, my favorite quote, out of every adversity comes a greater or equal opportunity, provided we can find it. Adversity brings in opportunities. Mm. Because dollar is going higher, cost of living is going higher, yes. it will automatically force us to produce locally. Mm. Mm. We will cut our rice intake. We will cut all the bread where we consume because they are, we are enriching other countries and we will have to produce locally. We will eat local tomatoes. So, you know, we should not look totally to the negative. The positive is we will create more jobs now because we don't have a choice. It's unfortunate, or it's unfortunate that because we don't have a choice, that's why we have to do it. Meaning 
When everything goes back early, we switch again. But right now, we have the opportunity to create the jobs. We have the opportunity to feed ourselves. We have the opportunity to depend less on imports. And guess what? We can grow our GDP better. If we have the right people, if we embrace our dams, and if we get the Ministry for Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry for Water Resources, Ministry for Finance, Ministry for Agriculture, Ministry for Youth and Development on the same table with a common goal. I believe one of the next uh, people coming in should be able to focus on that and we'll get results. So, so as it is, uh, what do you think about food inflation moving on in the year? Are we still going to stay high? Because it's looking like we're going to stay it's, on that. It's still going to go high, but the good thing also is that it's a producer's market now. Before, it was a buyer's market. But right now, it's the producer because demand is more than supply. So we need to talk to the private sector, you know, woo them, show them the numbers, and let's produce, make money, and start our processing. But it's not going to go lower. It's going to go higher. It's the people who have funds now, this is the time for them to make money. I must thank you so much for your time, Africa Forum Mogadi. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure having you break down issues surrounding the agricultural space. I'm making real sense of them. Do enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope that uh, things get better uh, than expected. It will. It will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me.